Supply and Demand, Chapter 3. In this video, we're going to look at the things that shift the entire market demand line. In the last video, we talked about the difference between demand and quantity demanded. The entire downward sloping line is what we call the market demand, and that is made up of all of the customer's preferences at various prices and quantities. One dot along that line is the quantity that's demanded at one specific price. In this video, we're going to look at the things that will change the entire market demand line. So these are your demand curve shifters. So if the demand line is going to shift to the right, that's what we call an increase in demand. And these are the things that would increase demand at all possible prices for all buyers in general, assuming all other things are equal. That means that nothing else is changing except for the thing that they're giving you in the question. And if the demand line shifts to the left, we call that a decrease in demand. And again, that is when the entire market demand and all the people and potential buyers decrease their demand for that product. Every time we shift a line to the right, it's an increase. And every time we shift the line to the left, it's a decrease. All right, you will need to memorize these. So here we go. The first demand curve shifter is the number of buyers. So if you have a particular city, and we'll say that that is a marketplace for a particular product, then if there are more buyers, meaning let's say more people move to that city, you now have more potential people who want to buy certain products. That will increase the number of buyers. Um, some of those buyers might want to buy the product at low prices, some at high prices. So this is going to affect that entire demand line shifting it to the right. If people leave the city, um, then you're going to have a decrease in potential buyers and that entire demand line will shift to the left. So if we take a look at this line here, again, this is our example with packs of gum. If we have more people who chew gum come into the market, um, we are going to increase demand. In this case, I increase demand by five units at every single price, shifting the entire demand line to the right. We call that an increase in demand or an increase in the market demand for gum in this case. The second thing that affects the demand line is the income of the buyers you have. So if you have the exact same amount of people in the market, but now their income is either higher or lower, maybe due to a recession or booming economy, then that's going to affect how much they can buy. So for most things, we call these normal goods. This is positive re positively related. So if you have more money, then you're going to buy more stuff. And people with more money increase demand for products. And that means we would shift that demand line to the right. And if the income of those buyers for normal goods, if their income goes down, we would decrease demand. Now, there's a certain selection of products that we call inferior goods. These are products that have the opposite effect of people's income. So as you get wealthier and you have more income, you actually buy these things less. These tend to be things like generic products, uh, uh, low cost products, things that people buy when they have little income. And so as they get more and more income, they start to increase the types of products they're buying. So if you go to the grocery store, for example, a bag of top ramen soup is typically an inferior good. We buy a lot of that when we're trying to pinch our pennies, when we really don't have a lot of money and we're trying to really budget our money. Um, other things like organic food, if you get a, a higher income, then you might shift to more fresh food, more organic food, and those would be a normal good because as your income rises, you're willing to spend more money on those products. The third thing is price, prices of related goods. So if we're in the market for one thing, some markets for other goods are similar or related. So there's two sub points here. The first one are substitute goods. And substitutes are goods that you can replace with one another. So uh, let's say product A and product B are competitors. And if product A is on sale, the demand for it is going to rise. And the demand for the thing not on sale is not going to rise. So, um, you know, substitute goods can be something really similar, um, like, you know, diet Pepsi and diet Coke. Um, they can also be something that you wouldn't see as very closely related. So diet Coke and lemonade, both of them are beverages and you can substitute one for another and you can substitute water or coffee for diet Coke as well. 
Now, some substitutes are close substitutes, um, like Diet Coke from Safeway and a Diet Coke from Fry's. Those are exact substitutes. Some are close substitutes, like Diet Coke and Diet Pepsi. And some are just general substitutes, like water and Diet Pepsi. Here's an, another example. So after school, you might want to go and get some food with your friends and you can go get pizza or you can go to get a hamburger. Those things are substitute goods. The prices at the particular places you and your friends are thinking about and the types of quality of food, the locations, all of those things are things that buyers think about. And these are going to be substitutes based upon uh, which place and, and how you decide that you want to, to uh, go there to eat. The other way that we look at prices of related goods are complementary goods. Complements are goods that consumers generally buy at the same time. So when people go to the grocery store to buy shampoo, they often buy conditioner as well, even if they weren't shopping for it at the time. People also tend to buy peanut butter and jelly at the same time. People, when they go to buy a brand new phone at, at the um, Apple store, tend to buy car chargers and cases and apps and things that go along with the phone. So sometimes, regardless of the price, we buy the complementary goods that come with it um, based upon the main product that we purchased. So for this example, I'm using computers and software. When people buy a computer, sometimes it comes with software, sometimes you go out and buy extra software, you buy apps in the app store and things like that. So if the computer, the price of the computer is more expensive, you're going to see less demand for the complements because if less people are buying computers, then they're also not buying as many of the things that go along with buying computers. Your fifth demand curve shifter are tastes and preferences. These are fads and things that are really popular for a short period of time. And um, typically when things are super popular, they, the demand rises for a short period of time. And then, you know, eventually they go back um, and shift back to the left. We see this a lot with sneakers, you know, certain a brand of sneakers, a certain type or a famous person who's come on, out with a sneaker brand. Uh, people get in line for hours, if not days ahead of time to buy limited edition sneakers. And then over time, we move on to something else that's super interesting. Um, taste and preferences can be affected by advertising or branding. Um, a famous person that's going to advertise a certain product will cause that product, if assuming that the uh, famous person is popular, the demand to rise. Um, but you can also have negative shifts in tastes and preferences. Um, let's say that there is a media story out that some particular product um, causes cancer, or there's an E. coli outbreak if you uh, eat spinach, and then suddenly people are buying less spinach because they're fearful of the contamination. So, these can also be things just like fads, cultural shifts. If you remember, there was a fad of for silly bands, these little rubber bands that were made to look like animals and other shapes. Those were, you know, super cool and in and kids liked them, you know, for a solid six months. Um, I also think of things like fidget spinners would be taste some preferences. The example I have here, the low carb and keto diets got really popular in the 90s and early 2000s. And suddenly people started eating tons of meat and vegetables and not eating as much bread. And it was so significant in the United States that you saw big increases in beef prices and demand for beef and big decreases in demand for things like bread and pasta. A lot of times buyers also make decisions based on expectations. So this can be what the buyer expects of the future price of the product or about their future income. So if you really want to buy a car, but for some reason you think that the price of that vehicle is going to be a little cheaper if you wait a couple months, then your demand for it is going to be the same now, but in the future it's going to go up. And now if you think about this on a market perspective, if a whole bunch of people think that a TV is going to go on sale uh, around Christmas time because we have all these Black Friday sales, then you might wait to buy the TV now and thus the market demand would drop today. But on Black Friday, the demand for TVs would rise. 
You also make expectations based upon your future income. So if you think that the economy is really bad and you're going to lose your job or you're not going to have as many hours and you need to, to you know, take a pay cut, that's going to affect your spending. If you think that something is going to happen to your income in the future, it causes people to change their buying habits today.